Welcome to Med Mythbusters HIV. I'm Rachel Deer with DKB Med. Today we have a webinar that's a little different. Our faculty will separate fact from fiction by debunking some common myths about HIV. Now I'd like to introduce our esteemed faculty, Justin Alves, a nurse educator from Boston Medical Center. Our learning objectives are describe recent trends in HIV incidents and discuss strategies to increase HIV testing and prevention. Justin, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Justin now, so let's get started with our first myth. The first myth is HIV is not a big deal anymore. That's false. HIV is still a big deal to many people who are living with HIV throughout the country, and we know that in 2023, approximately 38,500 diagnoses of HIV were made. Uh, as this is a 17% decrease from 2008, but it's still a very big number. And when we look at the country as a whole, what we see is that this new diagnosis is not sort of equitably geographically distributed. We see the highest rates of new HIV infection actually in the American Southeast, um, with almost 49% of the new infections occurring there. For our next myth, only gay men get HIV. This is also false. We know about one-third of new HIV diagnoses are attributed to something other than male-to-male -male sexual contact. Primarily, we think of this in two big categories, heterosexual contact and injection drug use. And sometimes we can't sort of make the difference out between men who have sex with men and injection drug use because people might engage in both. And so that's another sort of population that we see. I think a big important thing to remember here is that this myth actually can be pervasive and can actually prevent people who have heterosexual sex from getting services that they need, and it can prevent people who inject drugs from actually engaging in prevention and different counseling and testing sessions that they might need to learn more about HIV and make sure that they're protecting themselves. We know that when we look at sort of all of these populations, that we see the biggest decrease in new HIV infections among men who have sex with men. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying to sort of engage other folks in prevention care. We need to be talking more about how we offer PrEP to people who identify as heterosexual, particularly when we think about higher risk women, right, or women who have increased risk for HIV acquisition, and then people uh, who inject drugs who may be sharing paraphernalia or who may actually just be um, having sex with other folks who inject drugs and have risk themselves. Our next myth is that HIV is a young person's illness. This is also false. As of 2022, approximately 54% of Americans living with HIV are 50 years or older. And we expect this number to continue to grow as more and more people are diagnosed with HIV and continue to live long, healthy lives. Uh, when we look at the number of 38,000 new diagnoses in 2023, about 45% of those actually occurred in people over 35. And so when we talk about HIV as a young person's illness, what we know is that that is not true because people are aging with HIV and living healthy lives with a chronic illness. And we are seeing new HIV infections happen in people who are over age 35. It is not true that people over age 35 stop having sex, and it is not true that people over age 35 stop using drugs. And all of the same risk factors that young people have to acquire HIV also happen in people who are aging or who are older. And so really making sure that we're not missing populations of folks because we assume either A, they're not any longer sexually active, or B, they're no longer using any drugs. And so making sure that our messaging is universal and is not dependent solely on someone's age. Our next myth, people with HIV know they're sick. This is false. We know that there's a number of people who acquire HIV who never have any symptoms at all. There are also people who do have symptoms. I think another variation of this myth that I hear from patients is that, well, I would know if I had HIV, I would be sick. And I think that that's an, another sort of narrative that we as healthcare providers need to sort of combat against. When we look at the number of people living with HIV in the United States, about 87% of folks actually knew their status. That means that we have a significant number of people who don't know their status. 
And when we look at sort of age demographics related to who knows their status, young people between ages 13 and 24 are the least likely to know their status, with only about 56% of folks living with HIV actually knowing that they have it. And so a big important thing that we need to sort of address in this myth is that folks need to be tested because you don't always have symptoms. And so screening is an important and vital part of getting people the help and care that they need. Our next myth, only certain people should be tested for HIV. I've heard this even from my own mother, right? And what we know is that that's not the approach we should take for HIV screening. We really need to be doing universal screening so that we reduce the stigma and the barriers to care. We talk a lot about an HIV neutral approach to screening, meaning regardless of the outcome of your screening test, I'm still going to continue to take care of you. Either your screening test is going to be positive or reactive, and we're going to need to enroll you in care, maybe start treatment, maybe sort of get you to a specialist provider, or your test is going to be negative. And we're going to talk about ways to sort of protect that status. How do we make sure that you remain negative and that we reduce your risk for HIV acquisition, either through things like PEP or PrEP, or even just through sort of older school methods like using condoms. Our next myth, the only way to avoid HIV is to be monogamous. This is just simply not true. We, in the year 2025, have lots of options on the market to keep people safe, including pharmacologic therapies. Uh, Pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, is one way that we protect folks. So we have at least three different options for PrEP right now that are FDA-approved and on the market. We have tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate and emtricitamine. That's a pill you take every day. Or you could take it a 2 one one or um, on-demand fashion. Uh, we also have tenofovir um, alafenamide and emtricitamine, which is another single tablet daily regimen that folks can take uh, that's approved for cisgender men and trans women at sexual, um, at, who have sexual risk for HIV. And then we have the injectable on the market, which is injectable cabotegravir, which is given every two months um, for folks who are both cisgender women and men. We have another really exciting option coming on the market soon too that's going to be an every six-month injectable called lenacapravir um, that's been studied in a couple different populations with really, really good outcome data, including a study in sub-Saharan Africa uh, with cisgender women where it was 100% effective at preventing HIV. So really excited about the different formulations that we have um, in terms of PrEP. When we talk about PrEP as a whole, I think it's important to remind folks that PrEP reduces the risk of HIV acquisition from sex by about 99%. And for people who inject drugs, it reduces the risk from HIV by about 74%. Right? This isn't super well studied in people who inject drugs, but we actually anticipate that that number may even be higher than that 74%. PrEP doesn't protect against other STIs, but there are things like doxypep now that can certainly help reduce our risk um, for acquisition of things like syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia. We know that there are not many significant contraindications to taking PrEP. There are different versions of PrEP for different people, right? And so thinking about, you know, if I have maybe somebody who has a renal issue, maybe they're not going to be on a tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate-based regimen, maybe they're going to be on an injectable regimen. And so really starting to make sure that we are addressing the one major contraindication, which is a current HIV infection. So again, going back to that screening being important, we want to make sure that we're appropriately testing people so that people living with HIV are actually getting access to effective three-drug therapy um, and treatment right away. Um, and that folks who are negative are getting access to PrEP right away. Our next myth, HIV is transmitted in dental offices and other medical settings. In the beginning of the epidemic, there are many people who are concerned and scared about HIV being transmitted to healthcare providers. Uh, we know that between 1985 and 2013, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of people who have uh, been exposed to HIV sort of at work. Uh, we know that in the MMWR that was published of those 58 confirmed cases, only six uh, people in sort of that study were dentists, um, and none actually were confirmed cases from the exposure that they had. Uh, we know that when we look at OSHA or Occupational Safety and Health Administration standards, there are strict guidelines about employer responsibilities in the setting of blood or blood body fluid exposure. And we in the year 2025, offer rapid access to things like non-occupational and 
occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. This is when we give patients a full complement of HIV treatment for 28 days within 72 hours of an exposure to reduce their risk for HIV acquisition. Um, and we actually have a national PEP line that folks can call, 1-888-448-4911, uh, to be able to get advice on how to start a regimen or where they can go to access one. We know that the estimated correct probability of acquiring HIV from a needle stick is about 23 per 10,000 exposures, so not nearly as close to something like a blood transfusion. And when we talk about even anal receptive sex, um, that has a higher risk per 10,000 exposures than does a needle stick. Our next myth, HIV is a death sentence. This is demonstrably false. What we know is that throughout the years, we have seen an increase in the life expectancy of people with HIV. We went from HIV truly being a death sentence where there were no medications and people were acquiring HIV and dying from opportunistic infections to today where people are living long, healthy, normal lives on par with counterparts who don't have HIV. We know that one of the things that actually factors into somebody's life expectancy is things like CD4 count and age of diagnosis when people have HIV. And so that's, again, why it's super important to screen people for HIV and get them access to treatment early. We know with the, with the advent of antiretroviral therapy um, and these really highly active regimens that folks are able to take their medicine every day, reduce their HIV viral load, and reduce the inflammation in their body and have a normal life expectancy on par with those folks who don't have HIV. Overall, what we've seen um, in the general population is that deaths from HIV disease have dramatically dropped, with less than 5,000 deaths in 2023, according to CDC Wonder data, um, where HIV was listed as the cause of death. This is something to be celebrated. HIV is no longer a death sentence. It is a chronic illness, and people can take a pill every single day and live a normal life. And what's even cool now is that people don't need to just take a pill. There's lots of injectable options and infusion options even where people can still be managed without having to physically take something every day. So what are our key takeaways today from MedMythBusters? Approximately 38,000 new HIV diagnoses were made in 2003. 23, HIV is still very much a big deal. The South accounts for the greatest portion of these new HIV diagnoses. We know that after male-to-male -male sexual contact, heterosexual contact is the next biggest transmission category, accounting for 22% of new diagnoses. So this is not just men who have sex with men. It's not just gay men. Um, this is a problem that affects all sorts of different people. Everyone should be tested for HIV. We shouldn't be just targeting tests to people that we think need it. The status-neutral approach to care normalizes universal testing and addresses the HIV needs of the entire population, regardless of their HIV status. And we don't need people to just be monogamous and live in a bubble. We have things like PrEP and condoms and NPEP that are highly effective. PrEP is 99% effective in preventing HIV, with the only major contraindications really being HIV infection and, and people who, who can't tolerate it because of their weight. Thank you for joining us for Med Mythbusters. Uh, my name is Justin, and I hope I was able to dispel some of the common myths that we hear about HIV today, and I hope that you come back and join us for other sessions. Thank you, Justin, for busting those myths about HIV. And thank you for watching. Please check out part two of Med Mythbusters HIV, where we debunk myths about HIV and women. If you'd like to claim credit, please click the claim credit button to take the evaluation. Your thoughts and comments are important and help us develop additional education for Med Mythbusters. For CME information, check out mythhiv.dkbmed.com. For DKB Med, I'm Rachel Deere.